convinced one of the biggest battles that is waged on a daily, moment-by-moment basis is the one over our hearts, over your heart and over my heart. And if you haven't already, would you join me in preparing your heart for the Spirit of God to continue to work through the teaching of the Word? Would you pray with me? Father, I pray right now that you would use our hearts, that they would be good soil for you to implant your word into. God, I pray that you would move and work, and may we be obedient to listen, God. May we ready ourselves to receive whatever it is that you have for us to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you can have a seat wherever it is that you're at. Thanks so much uh, for being here. My name is Daniel. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you. I get the amazing privilege and honor to lead our kids ministry here at Northridge. Uh, And our kids ministry right now are going to the book of Exodus as well. Uh, It's one more way that we partner uh, with families. Um, And I'm just going to go ahead and jump out of the gate, acknowledge an accent that I possess that most of you don't. Uh, That's because I'm originally from Arkansas, born and raised there until uh, my wife and I moved to the Rochester area back in March. Now, you're doing some mental calculus right now, thinking like, what was happening back in March? And you're right. It was the perfect time to move uh, from Arkansas across the country uh, to join the amazing Northridge family. I mean, my wife and I were about two years married. Uh, She was four months pregnant. Uh, It's a great time, right? (laughs) And so we've enjoyed uh, being a part of the Northridge family for about seven months. It's crazy to think it's been that long, and I haven't had the chance to meet many of you. Uh, But now we have a a two-and-a-half-month-old. His name is Wells. Uh, My wife, Reen, and I, we've been married about two-and-a-half years, and uh, we're just loving being a part of Northridge and uh, the Rochester community. Together, I want us to go back, though, in our minds. If you can imagine with me elementary school, some of you in the room may be in elementary school, uh, but I want, to, want you to think about your elementary days. And you know, the ending part of the day is really what I want to talk about. When um, you got dismissed from school. For me, I was a bus rider. That means I was at the bottom of the barrel. I was the last one to get to actually leave school because the walkers got to go first, then it was the car riders, and then it was the bus riders. And I rode the bus for about 30 to 40 minutes out in the middle of nowhere, and if it wasn't nowhere, you could at least see nowhere from there, Arkansas, okay? And so gravel road for miles and miles and miles, like if you were there in the dark and heard banjos, you would get scared. That's what I'm talking about where I grew up, all right? And so uh, you couldn't see a house from my house. I was a bus rider, and I did not like it one bit. I hated it. Uh, It was dusty, and it was hot year-round. It wasn't fun. But there were rare days where I got to be royalty. I got to be a walker. Because my mom worked downtown, and you're thinking downtown, like downtown Rochester or whatever city it is that you live in. It's not that kind of downtown. My town of 2,000 less or less people, the downtown was four buildings, uh, and my mom's insurance office was one of them, okay? Uh, and so I would make the quick walk after school, when I was in elementary school, got to go first as walker to her insurance office, and five-minute walk, I'd say, hey to mom, I'd head to the back where the break room was, and there was uh, the amazing... Um, mini fridge that had Dr. Peppers in it and candy bars, and I'd grab me a Dr. Pepper and a candy bar. I'd immediately turn on the TV to ESPN because as an elementary kid, I love sports. I played anything that my mom and dad would let me play, um, and I, we didn't have cable way out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, we had antenna, which was like two channels, um, and so I turned on ESPN, and like clockwork, every time when I got to be a walker at that time of day, it was the ESPN top 10 plays of the week. And for an elementary kid, that was amazing because that talk sports radio, that's for somebody else to watch because I wanted to see the fun. I wanted to see the best of the best plays of that given night or that week. And I got to tune into that. And in this series, we've been in the life of Moses where we're affectionately looking at his top moments of his life, these pivotal moments in Moses' life and leadership and even the nation of Israel where Moses is growing as a leader, where he's developing as a leader. And today, this morning, we come to this place where I would make the argument, it's if not the top moment, one of the top three moments of his life. It's the Old Testament law. And I know I just say those words and you're like, are you kidding me? Like, I came to church for this? We're talking about the Old Testament law. But I want you to hang on with me because even though the Old Testament law may be boring 
uh, in, in its nature to us, mainly is because we don't have it framed up right, rightly of what it is for the people then. Because Moses and his leadership, he has contributed in the Old Testament law that he receives from God one of the most pivotal documents, constitution in history that have shaped not only the nation of Israel, but so many more nations that surrounded them geographically and even our own. Think about just the Ten Commandments. They helped shape our own nation's constitution and hung in many courthouses in the lobby of our Supreme Court for years. They helped our nation be established in how we wrote our constitution and the documents that helped establish our nation. So if we think about Moses and his contribution to the life of Israel, constitution, law, all these things, we try to equate him for someone or people in our own U.S. history, I would put before you that it, he is George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin all smashed into one individual because he's made that big of an impact on so many other nations. Just think about the term Jewish and anything that you can kind of in your mind equate to Jewish could be traced back to the man Moses. He's been a huge figure. And so this morning, what I'm seeking to do is talk about the Old Testament law, but I won't, don't want to get into the minutia and like, let's dive into these specific laws and what they meant then. No, no. I just simply want to answer two questions this morning. First, what was the point of God giving them, the people of God, the law then? And second, what is the role of the law in the Jesus followers life today? Those two questions is all I'm seeking to answer, but we have some groundwork to cover. Where we've been at in this series so far in the life of Moses as we started out as Moses enters the world. He enters the world in trouble because uh, the nation of Israel is in slavery in the land of Egypt, but God rescues him, places him in the palace of his enemy, which is the best place for him to be. And then through Moses' failures and these trials, these different processes, God still calls Moses, still chooses Moses, and uses Moses in spite of of his failures as an instrument to save the people of Israel. Then Moses shows back up in Egypt, and God, through his own power, uh, does these plagues, these miracles to rescue uh, Israel out of the land of Egypt. And then when Moses and the people of Israel get to the Red Sea, Moses shows his dependence on God alone, where God alone could help them in that moment. And then last week, we saw Moses develop even more as a leader, where he uh, goes to God on behalf of the people of Israel when they need food and water three separate times, where God is testing Israel and then Israel is negatively testing God. And now in our story, in the book of Exodus, if you have a Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 19. We'll be there in just a second. Moses finds himself at Mount Sinai again. This is the place, the geographical location where the burning bush moment happened with God. And there he is again, Moses and God, and God tells Moses, this is what I want to do with the people of Israel. Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Moses gets the terms of this covenant with the nation of Israel and God, and he takes it to the elders and the people of Israel, and they say, yes. What I'm about to do now, just letting you know, I'm doing a flyover to Exodus chapter 19. And just by getting the people of Israel to this point in history, getting them here, I want to point out that God has remained faithful to the promises he made to Abraham back in Genesis. In Genesis 15, God makes promises to Abraham and he keeps them. And now he's getting ready to make more promises to Moses and to the people of Israel. He gives them the law that come alongside the previous promises that have been made. But I want you to understand something here. We all need to understand this, that the relationship between God and Israel did not start when they said, yes, we'll do what you say. It didn't start there. It didn't even start with Moses. 
It started many years earlier when that man, Abraham, at this time, his name was Abram. God spoke to him and said, go, I want to take you somewhere. And by faith, he went. Fast forward Genesis chapter 15 and 17, that same God made a covenant with Abram, who was a childless old man. And he changed his name to Abraham for this reason. Genesis 17, 5, no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. In Genesis, God spoke and said, even though, Abraham, you can't see it yet, your name will be great. And that one man and woman had a baby named Isaac, that small family, though great, because even small families are great. We know that, right? And we fast forward. This small family has found itself in the land of Egypt, now not a small family, but a nation. They are great. God kept his promises with that big family, and now he is making more promises. Jump back in our story. Exodus um, chapter 19, the people say yes to God's laws. So Moses goes back up the mountain and God gives him instructions. And Moses, when he comes back down the mountain again, he tells the people, make yourselves ready. In three days, God's going to show up in power. They probably have no idea what this means, but they just know we got to ready ourselves for two days because on the third day, God's going to show up. And day three happened. And this is what happened. Imagine for yourself, you're standing at the base of a mountain, and off in the distance, you hear a trumpet sound. And then all of a sudden, smoke covers the top of this mountain, a thick cloud of smoke. Lightning and thunder and fire show up on top of this mountain, and the sound of that trumpet, it's getting louder, and it's getting louder, and it's getting louder. And Moses, I can only imagine, he's like, God? And God speaks to Moses and says, come up. And Moses, he doesn't just go up by himself. He takes Joshua, his right-hand man. Maybe Moses is a little scared. Maybe he just wants some backup. I don't know. But he takes Joshua up to the top of the mountain with God where Moses gets the law. And then he comes back down the mountain and tells the people the law. That's how we read it, linear story in our Bibles in the book of Exodus. But I want to point out that Joshua and Moses and God spend 40 days up on the top of this mountain. And the way that the writer of the book of Exodus is laying out this story is the way that you would watch a movie where multiple scenes are jumping back and forth at the same spot in time, but you're seeing different perspectives of different geographical locations. And this is what's happening in the book of Exodus. Because what is happening is there's events happening at the top of the mountain with God, Joshua, and Moses. They're receiving the law. So if you read Exodus chapter 20 through 23, you're reading all these lists of rules. And then you fast forward more in the book of Exodus, and there's events that happen at the exact same time in history, but at the bottom of the mountain with the people looking up, and all they can see and hear are the, is the trumpet, the thunder, the lightning, and the smoke. And so we read the story a lot of times like, well, why'd the people of Israel mess up when they had these rules and they hadn't received them yet because of the way that the writer is laying this book out? So it's not a linear story at, in this section. It's more woven throughout. I just make that reference point so when you read the book of Exodus, you can kind of have this in the back of your mind because most of that I'm not going to be able to cover because where we have it at with the Old Testament law, there was Moses and the people of God and God made a formal covenant with them that gave them laws and instructions which they were to order their lives around in a relationship with him. These laws and instructions by God given by God to Israel at Mount Sinai represent one of the greatest possessions that they would ever have. Because the nation of Israel had what no other nation had. They had righteous laws and decrees that were set before them. And these laws were to govern Israel's relationship to God, one another, and the people living around them. But the issue that they find themselves in, they couldn't keep them. I mean, just open your Bible for yourself and read in Exodus chapter 20, which is the Ten Commandments, the big ten, right? The ten words that we frame everything up with. And read it with the lens like this. Read it like this. Have I been perfect in my motive and my deed and my action with these laws? And it won't take you long, like it doesn't take me long to say, nope, nope. And you just keep going down. Read the rest of Exodus 20, 21, 22, and 23. Or maybe venture out to the entire book of Leviticus. And you will find more that you've broken that you've actually kept. 
Or maybe you'll be like me, just really confused and don't understand why these laws are in here or what their purpose actually is. So what was the point of the law being given to these people who wouldn't or couldn't keep it? And this is a moment that we come to where we don't make the statement, well, you know, rules are made to be broken, right? I mean, I mean how many times have most of us said this in our lives, that rules are made to be broken? But God, with his relationship with Israel, what he does, he equates it to a marriage relationship. I don't know how many of you are married right now, but when you stood across the altar to your husband or wife and you made those marriage vows, I guarantee if we had a conversation, you wouldn't make, well, you know, those were just made to be broken. No, not at all. And so this is the same scenario that Israel finds themselves in. They find themselves in a covenant partnership relationship with God, but they've broken it. They've messed up. So what is the point? Why did God give these laws to a people who wouldn't or couldn't keep them? First, understand that the Law was given as a gift of God's grace. It did not create the relationship between God and Israel because God chased Israel down and declared mine. Exodus 19 verse 4, look at it again with me. This is what God says to Moses. I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. Right before Moses is supposed to give the Ten Commandments to the people of God, this is what God says. Tell them this, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So for Israel, it was relationship, then law. So in Jewish life, the law first revealed God's perfection. These laws showed how perfect God was. They showed his separateness from other humans, how holy he is. They showed the heaviness and the weight that he alone carries. They showed his glory. Second, in Jewish life, the law was the standard. Israel was marked. His chosen people, separate from all other nations. The law gave Israel a standard for godly living so that they might inherit the land and enjoy its blessings. It taught them how to love God and love the people around them in their context. That's why a lot of the times we get confused at the laws because we're not living in their context. But I made this short list of how the laws behaved. This is not exhaustive, just what I found of what these laws were in the context of Israel. These laws were pro-social justice, pro-family, pro-women, pro-sanctity of human life pro-rights of aliens that must be respected when they're living in a land that is not their own, pro-order, pro-government, and by nature promoted human flourishing. Yet, before the people even received these laws, it was important that they personally encountered the God who brought them into relationship with him and out of the land of sin. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, this is what it says, when the people saw the thunder and the lightning, heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself, we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Because if Israel followed the laws of Moses, came right from God himself, within them, they led them to a closer relationship with God, not to earn their salvation, but if they followed these laws with the right motivation, they would receive the blessings that were promised to them, and they would not be cursed. Leviticus chapter 26 is just one of these places if you want to read it on your own. But if you know any bit of the Old Testament story, you know that the nation of Israel spends spends most of their time receiving the wrong side of God's promises because they do not follow God's laws. They get cursed. God remained faithful to his promise. They did not follow the laws they were supposed to, so they did not receive the fullness of God's blessings. They received the curses. They were exiled from slavery, they, they, from their land, and they found themselves in slavery because they did not follow the law. So this leads us to the third point of the law, which is in Jewish life, the law revealed human sinfulness. But in this way, the law was preparing the nation of Israel for the one who would come to right all their wrongs, Jesus. 
The law was their tutor. It trained them, prepared them like a child for adult living. When the child was mature and entered adulthood, they could receive the fullness of their inheritance, no longer needing a tutor. Israel was a spiritual child under the law, and they needed preparing for Jesus. The law was showing Israel that God cared for them. What would have been far worse is if God would have been indifferent for God to say, you don't even know you're messed up. Oh, well, I'll try again when, when you die and someone else comes along. No, what God did is he chased them down. He said, you can't do this your way. You mess things up. You ruin everything. So what God did is he chased them down and declared mine, which is exactly what God does for us. If you follow my ways, God tells them, things can be different because God's people have always had one mission, follow God because of the relationship that he started. The law wasn't giving the people of Israel their salvation, nor can anyone following any list of rules gain your salvation. The law was never designed for that. By following the law, it wasn't Israel earning salvation because what they needed, the law could not provide. Both the Old Testament and the New tells us that all people need one thing, a heart change. Because religion following rules is not enough to bring about a heart change. It never has been. From the beginning of time, when the first man and woman sinned against God, God took an animal before the legal sacrificial system was even in place in the book of Leviticus, and God made a sacrifice and covered them. And then the entire law and its system to help people be able to come into the presence of God pointed to one promise hope, one promise once and for all sacrifice. So to answer the question of what is the point of the law in the life of Jesus followers today, I want to use Jesus' own words. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus makes this statement. I've come not to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. How did he fulfill it? He fulfilled the law by living the perfect life in deed and motive. And the writer of Hebrews, reflecting on his, this situation and the law, says this, Hebrews 10, 1. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities of themselves. For this reason, it never can, by the same sacrifices repeatedly, endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who are drawing near to come to worship. Jump down to verse 10. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all meaning law fulfilled. Once for all meaning law done. So what's the role of the law in our lives today? First, followers of Jesus are called to follow Jesus, not the law. Our responsibility is not to the law, it's to Jesus. The letters of the law were written on stone, but God, through the power of his Holy Spirit today, writes the law of Christ on Jesus' followers' hearts. We have today what every Old Testament believer longed to see happen. If you're a Jesus follower, you have the Holy Spirit within you in fullness. Now something greater than what the people of Israel standing at the bottom of the mountain of God, looking up and seeing Moses and Joshua in the presence of God, we have it. Imagine Israelites standing at the bottom of the mountain, seeing the, the thunder and hearing the, the lightning, the thick cloud of smoke and the fire and the loud trumpet. I'm sure there were some of them saying, man, what would it be like to be in the midst of that power and that holiness today? You have the presence of God. You're a walking temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, no longer is your life being governed by a law written on stone, but one that is written on your heart and modeled after the life of Jesus. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You, as a Jesus follower today, should be marked by two things, a life-giving spirit and love. Marked by a life-giving spirit, meaning the words we say, the attitudes we have, and every morning we should wake up and recognize that we have the spirit of God living inside of us. And because of Jesus, I can be content. Because of Jesus, I have all I need. Because of Jesus, I'm a walking, talking, living, breathing, miracle of the Lord God Almighty. And second, we're called to be marked by love. 
there's several places in the New Testament where Jesus and his love can be seen as his, and through his life, that Jesus' love was constantly putting others' needs before his own. That's what Jesus' followers, our lives are called to be marked with. You know, a marker is simply an identifier. We, and every weekend, we use these in kids' ministry. If you've ever checked your kids in or seen kids running around Northridge, you'll see them with this marker, this sticker that's stuck right to their bellies. Because when you check them in, uh, we hand you that sticker and we tell you, hey, put that right there on their bellies. And uh, about two years ago, Rena and I were watching our God kids. We have two. Uh, Koi's seven now. Journey Grace is about to be three. And Koi was five. He had just turned five years old. And he, was, he stayed the night with us on a Saturday night. And Sunday morning, we woke up and took him to church. And this was his first time going to elementary because uh, he had just started kindergarten. And he was going into the elementary environment for the first time. And they did big group and music and games. And he was super excited. We checked him in. He got that sticker. He put it right there on his belly. And he goes to large group. And the large group teacher, they're teaching. And they ask a question. And man, he's inquisitive. So he shoots up that hand. He's probably on the second row. And she calls on him. And she doesn't know his, recognize his face because, you know, that was pre-mass days. And so, um, but she points him out and she's like, I don't, I can't, what's your name? If you imagine five-year-old Koi, he's baffled by this. He's like, what's my name? You're supposed to know my name. It's right here. That's, he didn't say that, but this is, this is what happens. He goes, Koi. <laughs> so she laughs it off, answers the question big group moves on. After service, we were standing in the lobby, Rena and I were, and he comes up to us, we got him, and she, she comes up to us because we worked at the church, and uh, she knew we didn't have any kids. She's like, oh, well, who's this to you guys? And we, oh, it's our godson, Coy. And she told us that story. And right before she got to the part where he said, and insert his name, she forgets his name again. And she casually tries to like lean down and like look at his name tag. And he goes, it's coy. You see, he knew something. He knew he was marked. He knew that she wasn't supposed to recognize him by that look on his face, but he had an identifier. She was supposed to know his name. Thinking about that story and thinking about my life, I wonder if I live that way. If the closer that people get to me in relationship, the more clear and clearer it is that I'm marked by something that's different. Not by a love that I muster up within me and I have earned this. And so it's like, yes, I'm proud of this. But a love that comes from outside of me, a love that stepped out of heaven and came to earth, lived the life that I could not live, died the death that I deserved, and on my behalf made a once and for all sacrifice. So list of rules, done. My courage, my strength, my motivation in the morning isn't, man, how good have I been for God today, but oh my goodness, how good is my Savior. Because he's marked me. And it's because of his love that I experience his love freely given to me. And therefore, I freely give it to others. His love has marked me. It's changed me. And the closer others get to me in relationship, the more clearly it should be identified. In the grocery store, in the office, wherever it is that you're in relationship, it should constantly be looked at of a love that constantly puts others' needs in front of our own. That constantly is not achieving or earning or grasping, like I need more of God's love. How can I earn it today? Man, I've prayed, I've read my Bible, I've tied to the church. I've, man, how many rules have I followed? No. It's a love that has been freely given and one that is modeled after the life of Jesus and given from him. Do you live marked? May that be the story of me and of you this week and forever. That we don't seek to follow a set of rules and regulations of do's and don'ts, but we simply model our lives after the one that gave it for us. And on our behalf, we model ours after his because he is risen and he is risen indeed. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much that your son did for us what we could not do for ourselves. 
He lived the life that I could not live. He died the death that I deserved. And because of Jesus, I can experience your love freely and give it to that measure. God, I pray that I would live a life that's constantly marked by a life-giving spirit and your love. And I pray the closer people get into relationship with us, the more clearly it will be seen that we are marked by something different, marked by your presence and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.